So in this video, we're gonna be talking about the three treatment aims for inflammatory bowel disease. We're gonna be skipping a lot about the pathophysiology and the mechanism of action and the common symptoms. We'll weave a little bit of that in, but I wanted to keep it nice, short, and sweet and focus on the three major treatment, the body systems and, and the reasons why, really where I'd be spending all of my focus and attention, depending on the IBD patient, we gotta kinda really narrow in on one or all of these to improve symptoms and help get someone back into remission. In the Byron Herbalist Clinic, I see patients with small intestinal bacterial overgrowth or SIBO or IBS, fungal overgrowth, but really those IBD patients, they can be the toughest to treat and that's because it's such a significant condition. You know, a lot of the time they, they've worked with the foundational pieces and they haven't seen results, you know, so they'll already be coming to me as a bit more of an experienced uh, patient. We need to be kind of pulling out all the stops and looking for reasons why these foundational pieces and these common treatments didn't didn't help them or didn't really significantly improve their condition. So there'll be a few links in the description below to products that I commonly use for my IBD patients, but remember to talk to your prescribing practitioner and that this is education only, it's not recommendations. So treatment aim number one, we want to modulate and reduce inflammation in the body. This is pretty straightforward. I mean, inflammation is driving a lot of those symptoms and the uh, root cause presentation. I mean, it's in the name for crying out loud, inflammatory bowel disease. It's not rocket science to put together that inflammation is a big part of the problem. So I said I'd keep it short and sweet. Three top herbs that I'd use as anti-inflammatories. Top of the top would be turmeric or a turmeric extract like curcumin. Most IBD patients have worked with that. It's really kind of commonly known, it's a really kind of valuable herbal approach and most of them probably haven't seen improvements when they come to my clinic, otherwise they wouldn't be coming to uh, work with me. So the other two that, that, that get a play almost every time, unless a patient can't tolerate it, would be Boswellia and Wormwood. And I'm finding, particularly with the treatment resistant patients, wormwood can be so, so helpful at kind of blocking and reducing that inflammatory cascade that's driving a lot of the symptoms in the presentation. Now, those are the top three. It doesn't end there. We have almost a never ending list of herbs that might be specific for you. And that's really the beauty of herbal medicine. I mean, when you're talking about the pharmaceuticals that you'll use, or be recommended by a gastroenterologist, you know, they'll start off low and they'll kind of ramp them up all the way up to biologics that are actually like blocking a lot of those, um, you know, immune responses and things like tumor necrosis factor alpha, you know, et cetera. They're getting more and more kind of complicated and targeted. Um, the biologics, but they don't have a huge toolkit to treat this condition. Herbal medicine on the other side, we've almost got a never ending list of, of herbs that might be suitable for you. And it's really about working with a skilled herbalist to kind of find that right piece to the puzzle that you see significant improvements. And I'd give a certain protocol, I'd give it four to six weeks, and if that wasn't doing the trick, I'd start to kind of lay layer on different herbal approaches and drop away on things that weren't re really moving the needle or tolerated. That's the other big piece. Fish oil is another big piece here that I see improvements in some IBD patients. Sometimes you really need to ramp the dose up to quite big doses to get improvements short term. And I've got one Crohn's disease case study that you can check out here where we found that a huge driver of her flares and her high cal protectin and an extreme inflammation was an imbalance of the omega-6, omega-3 ratio. And even the industrial seed oils, I mean, she was doing really good at keeping them out and then she'd be exposed and her calprotectin would kind of flare all the way up to 2000, which is just crazy inflamed. That's extremely high. And then when we found that puzzle, 
reduced and eliminated a lot of those omega sixes and started to build up a lot of those omega threes in her diet and as fish oil, she got a huge, huge bump in her symptoms, huge improvements. Treatment aim number two, we want to retune a dysregulated immune system. And I think this treatment aim is a little bit underappreciated and it makes more sense when you understand the specifics of the pathophysiology here for IBD. I know I said I was going to keep it simple, keep all that scientific mumbo jumbo out but you know just bear with me it's definitely worth following along here because there's some really significant pieces for the right IBD patient. Now pathophysiology time. An aberrant or dysregulated immune system is a major driver of inflammatory bowel disease and right here the connection between the immune system and inflammation it's, it's kind of the same thing, right? Inflammation and the inflammatory cascade and the inflammatory process is the immune system trying to resolve a problem, whether it's a bacterial infection, whether it's tissue damage, whether it's both in the case of most IBD patients. This is a really, really big piece. Now the big question is why? This is what we have to figure out. We can do some testing that we're gonna talk about in a second. We can do some questions. We can do some trials and see how you uh, improve. But the big question is why? Why is your immune system kicked into overdrive and is just burning the house down around you with that inflammatory process. That's a topic for a future video. We could spend hours on that one. Let's keep it short and sweet. The big, big piece, and again, there'll be a link in the description below. Talk to your prescribing practitioner first. Make sure if it's right for you. I have seen good improvements in the right IBD patient with a serum-derived immunoglobulin product. Before these came onto the market, um, a lot of people were turning towards colostrum, and I have seen good improvements in some patients with IBD with colostrum as long as they can tolerate it. And that's the caveat. They don't tolerate everything, and colostrum can be a little bit of a reactive product for the wrong person. On the serum-derived immunoglobulin front, and it's a very similar product, it has similar kind of actions, it's a lot cleaner and it's a lot better tolerated. So I've learned a lot from Dr. Ruscio. He kind of turned me on to the serum-derived immunoglobulins and he was sharing a little bit of his uh, clinical experience there. And he has this really great analogy. It's kind of what I think about every time I think about the mechanism of action of the immunoglobulins. And he describes its action almost like dipping broken glass into wax it kind of like blunts the edges and you don't get that sharp damage it has some binding effects so it can bind to LPS or endotoxins it's got some antimicrobial effects and it can also you know improve that immune response you know that dysregulated immune response treatment aim number three and I can't believe it took us three treatment aims to get to this because this is my favorite piece and I spend a lot of time on this one with all of my digestive health patients and that is micro microbiome rebalancing and microbiome support, whether we need to reduce unfriendly bugs, whether we need to remove pathogens. I mean, that's huge. There's some bugs that just have to go. Whether we need to nourish and feed and support the beneficials so that they can produce butyrate and they can kind of resolve this large bowel gut damage, that we have so many tools to support your microbiome. From prebiotics, we've got polyphenols, we've got probiotics, we've got fiber in the diet as long as a patient can tolerate it. That's more when patients are in remission or heading towards remission. And then dietary man manipulation can be big here too. So IBD in a nutshell, you've got that dysregulated immune system that's kicking off that inflammatory cascade. You've got the genetics to run with that inflammation and kind of burn the house down around you. And then the last piece is the microbiome kind of touching up on that immune system to start that whole vicious cycle again. So just before we push on into the last step, microbiome restoration, do me a favor, if you're getting anything out of this, then like and subscribe. It just tells me that you're getting something out of this and encourages me to make more videos for you. Now, if we're talking about microbiome restoration, the hallmark presentation of IBD is low diversity, and there can be so many reasons. We can talk about that in a future video. Born as a C-section, didn't get breastfed, whether you had antibiotics when you were young, whether you had a 
ton of antibiotics when you're an adult, whether it was all of that and more, diet's really big, lifestyle's really big as well. But supporting that microbiome piece, it can be a little bit tricky. I think it's really wise to spend a little bit of money up front. I've got my recommendations on functional stool testing here, and you can get data beyond just bacterial imbalances. I mean, bacteria is huge, and they're huge drivers of IBD, things like E. coli, you know, frequently elevated, commonly elevated. I'm surprised when they're not elevated. But then some stool testing, like the complete microbiome mapping, which I recommend, would tell us about the chemistry. And that's a really big piece because things like low butyrate and high zonulin, that would be a marker of intestinal hyperpermeability. Those again are strong drivers of IBD for different reasons. Now it can be a little bit tricky. Patients here can be a bit reactive. I find that with the right patient, antimicrobials to help reduce less friendly bugs, pomegranate is a really great place here. Sometimes we use demulcent herbal medicines to build up that gut lining, to kind of build a little bit of a barrier between, again, that microbiome and the immune system, right? That's where everything's kind of going wrong for a lot of patients. We also want to be healing up the um, leaky gut markers, whether it's the small bowel, something like glutamine, again, serum-derived immunoglobulins are big, whether it's the large bowel, something like butyrate. And I do use and recommend butyrate. Again, there'll be a link in the description below for the butyrate that I would recommend most of my IBD patients. But the long-term strategy is to get your microbiome to produce enough butyrate so we don't get hooked on a supplement. So it's rarely treatment aim one, treatment aim two, treatment aim three. It doesn't kind of play out like that, but it's about determining where things are kind of the worst for you intervening there and then seeing what unpacks you know the, the the biggest thing that i can share here is that give it time i've got some patients that won't give it a month to see how far we can get if you're seeing significant improvements if we've just modulated and reduced that inflammation in a month i'm 50 percent better great <laughs> do the same thing for another two months Tell me if you're completely resolved and in remission, and then we'll check in with your gastroenterologist and see what they think. We do a month on that approach. No real improvements, actually I'm a little bit worse. Okay, let's modulate this piece, let's drop away on what I suspect you were flaring on and not tolerating, and let's bring in phase two and phase three um, as needed and appropriate for you. So if you found that helpful, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. And if you're living in Australia or New Zealand and you're looking for digestive health support, then reach out to the clinic.